Hi everyone and welcome to the last open quartal hour of the year, Dress Up. And my name is Leila Bumbra and I'm the program manager for the research forum here at the Quartal. And to start as always, thank you again to Bloomberg Philanthropies for their generous support of our digital initiatives, especially all things open quartal. So this quartal um, open quartal hour, which is rounding up the year, is based on the quartal's collection and how it is often used as a tool to discuss how historic fashions, such as the glamorous outfits worn in Renoir's Loge, can be understood by a modern audience. So this hour will read the fashion depicted in our collection to elevate how our collection can and has been used to encourage ethical consumerism, support small businesses, and inspire contemporary practitioners and students to get creative. From what to wear to what jewellery to gift, this open quarter hour will be basically your ultimate art historical guide to the festive season, which is something I think everyone will need after the week we've had. So onto the structure of the event, there will be a range of informal talks and in conversations, and the session will end with a panel discussion that gives you all the opportunity to ask any questions. So what to do is to pop those in the chat throughout, and I will try to ask as many as I can later on. Um, before we start, I wanted to flag that we are on at Quartal Res on social media if you want to get your questions or comments to us that way. We would also love, which I can see some of you already doing, is to tell us where you are from, like zooming in from in the chat. That would be great. It's just lovely to get a sense of where everyone is in the world when we're doing these things. So it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Charlotte. Charlotte Reynolds is responsible for the Ulster Museum collection of historic and contemporary fashion and textiles. And she's also responsible for Ulster Museum's collections of jewelry, silver and dolls and toys. And as a partner of the Portals, Ulster Museum was loaned recently our La Loge. And this evening, Charlotte has been really generous and is going to talk us through how to read dress in La Loge and also speak hopefully a little bit more about the art history and of our collection, and also the collection housed in Belfast. So thank you again, Charlotte. I will hand it over to you to get started. Oh, thank you. It's a lovely introduction. Um, yeah, no, thank you for having me here this evening and um, looking forward to diving into La Loge. Um, so I will start by attempting to share my screen. Okay, I'll get started. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit this evening about uh, the fashion that we see in Renoir's La Loge. Um, so La Loge was painted by uh, Pierre-Auguste Renoir in 1874 and exhibited in the first ever Impressionist exhibition in April that year. Now in this image, uh, we see an extravagantly dressed woman seated in a box at the opera. Whilst her eye-catching black and white gown makes her the focus of our attention, in the background there is another figure, a black-clad male companion scanning his surroundings with binoculars. Whilst the pair's relationship in the painting is ambiguous, there are no clear signs that they are married. In real life, we know the figures to have been Nini Lopez, one of Renoir's favourite models, and the artist's brother, Edmund. In today's talk, I'm going to go in detail into the fashion worn in La Loge to help us gain a deeper understanding of the painting and contemporary reactions to it. As I am a curator of a fashion collection at the Ulster Museum, I will also be making reference and comparison to garments in the museum's collection and others as much as possible during this talk. So fashion is at the heart of La Loge and was an important feature in many works by Impressionist artists who saw it as a marker of modernity. For example, Monet painted Women in the Garden, 1866, in which the scene is dominated by crinolined summer dresses. Also seen here is Young Woman in a Ball Gown by Berthe Morisot, 1879, which depicts a young woman wearing a restrained evening dress that would have perfectly aligned with illustrations in fashion journals from the period. Renoir himself would have been well acquainted with fashion as his father was a tailor and his mother a dressmaker. I'll begin my, ana my analysis by talking about the most striking feature of Nini's dress, its wonderful black and white stripes, which are absolutely true to fashion trends of the period. 
Stripes were all the rage in the early 1870s, as we can see from various fashion illustrations, such as these two from The Queen, 1871, and La Mode Illustrée, 1872. The early this enthusiasm for stripes was itself part of a larger trend in the early 1870s for referencing styles worn a century earlier in pre-revolutionary France. This trend also included features like elbow length ruffled sleeves, which we also see in some of these illustrations and on Nini's dress in La Loge. These are two striped 18th century dresses from the Ulster Museum that give an idea of the older styles fashion conscious women in the 1870s were emulating. Here we have a cream striped silk red and coat dress dated circa 1785, and beside that, a pink and gray satin open robe dated around 1787. Here is a dress from 1750 from the LA County Museum of Arts collection with elbow length ruffled sleeves. And I've placed it here beside a silk and green velvet French dress from the Ulster Museum's collection dating from the early 1870s. So something that could have been worn by one of Nini's contemporaries. Place side by side, you can see the various references that the 1870s dress is making to that earlier style, including the use of decorative bows, the square cut neckline, and like Nini's dress in the loge, the use of ruffles at the sleeves, a style that was referred to as Marie Antoinette sleeves. And these two images are just to give you a better view of that 1870s French dress from the Ulster Museum and also some idea of the size of the gown that Nini is wearing in La Loge. When La Loge was first exhibited, the critic Jean Prouvaire wrote that Renoir had depicted a cocotte in black and white who will attract people with her wicked charms and the sensuous luxury of her clothes. A rather extreme reaction to a painting that to most modern eyes would seem innocent enough. However, as we continue to look closer at her outfit, we realize that there are certain features of Nini's dress that are unusual and that would have been picked up on by contemporary audiences. So to begin with, the elbow length sleeves of her dress mark it as a less formal outfit or as a demi toilette. Essentially, the dress etiquette for evening wear was that the more formal and splendid the occasion, such as a first night at the opera and in a box no less, the shorter the sleeves and the lower the neckline. The fashion illustration seen here from La Revue de la Mode 1877 with its short sleeves, low neckline and elaborately dressed hair is far more what one would have expected to see and was called a toilette de soiree. This painting by Eva Gonzalez, a box at the Italian's theater shows another example of a toilette de soiree Painted in the same year as La Loge, it gives us a more typical view of how a woman would have usually been dressed for the opera. Here as well, the male companion takes a back seat, but their relationship seems more respectable. Unlike Nini's companion, he is not surveying the rest of the theater, possibly for other women. Here you see alongside La Loge, a fashion illustration from Harper's Bazaar, 1876, of another form of demi-toilette, described as a dinner toilette. In other words, an evening dress suitable for a nice dinner, but not overly formal. There are various similarities between it and the one worn in La Loge, which seems to suggest that despite the gown's apparent extravagance, Nini actually seems to be oddly underdressed for the opera. But what about her accessories? Have a look at the woman's neck in the illustration. She seems to be wearing a simple velvet or ribbon choker with a pendant and compare that to the lavish strings of pearls somewhat messily arranged around Nini's neck. Aileen Ribeiro notes that the pearls are an unexpected touch as simpler jewelry was more usual with a demi toilette. Other lavish accessories worn by Nini include pearl earrings, a gold bracelet, gold opera glasses, a lace fan, an ermine fur wrap, and less expensively, but all the same noticeably, roses adorn her hair and draw attention to her decolletage. 
Just to help give a sense of what is unusual about Nini's necklace, I'm going to contrast her jewelry with that worn in Mary Cassatt's Woman with a Pearl Necklace in a Loge, 1879, in which we see a young woman in formal evening toilette with short sleeves and low neckline, restrained accessories, and a simple hairstyle that matches her unostentatious jewelry. Valerie Steele has pointed out that it was not the convention for unmarried women to wear lavish outfits and jewels to the theatre, and in fact, due to its scandalous reputation, many respectable young middle-class women avoided it altogether so as not to tarnish their innocence. Fashion, glamour, and eroticism were actually the purview of married women under the aegis of a husband. The fact that Nini wears such lavish jewellery yet does not have a clear marital relationship to the male companion behind her, helps explain what prompted the critic Prouvaire from earlier to brand her a cocotte, perhaps hoping to attract attention from other men. Another implication that this woman is of the demi-monde comes from her makeup. We can see quite clearly that her lips and cheeks are rouged and she may be wearing some sort of liner around her eyes and eyebrows. We can see from how the skin on her décolletage and her face don't quite match that she is wearing face powder to whiten her complexion. Prouvaire also had lovely comments about her makeup and what he believed this implied about her as a person, writing, the cheeks whitened with pearl powder, the eyes animated with a blandly passionate look. She is attractive and useless, delightful and stupid. Her hair is also a little off for the opera. It is oddly disheveled compared to the style seen in fashion journals at the time, such as this illustration of ladies' coiffures from Harper's Bazaar, 1876. For evening coiffures, it was customary to wear arrangements of flowers and sometimes feathered headpieces as well. Maybe this aspect reveals more than anything else Nini's true background as a young woman from a poor part of Montmartre. It may also be reflective of the artist's personal tastes. Renoir's son Jean said that his father actually hated women's slavish devotion to their appearance, such as tight corsets, high heels, and over elaborate hairstyles. So, when compared with contemporary fashion illustrations and other paintings depicting similar scenes of fashionably turned out women at the theater, we start to realize that despite the lovely visual spectacle, many factors of Nini's ensemble are incongruous and would have signaled some suggestive messages about this woman's place in society and her morality to contemporary audiences. We have seen that her dress, while lavish, is not right for the occasion. Her jewelry is inappropriate, both for the dress and for an unmarried woman. Her makeup is noticeable and her hairstyle is oddly distressed. Traveled. By analyzing the clothing worn in La Loge, we start to decode the details that fashion in art can reveal, a skill of particular importance when looking at the work of the Impressionists. And that finishes me up there. So I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Charlotte. It's um, so lovely to hear about that work. I spent quite a long time yesterday looking at it, so it's really great to think about it again and and remember why the dress that she wears is so significant. And I'm sure a lot of people will have plenty of questions for you when we get to the panel. So thanks again. But for now, we are moving on to something that is actually really closely tied to Charlotte's work and Belfast again. So I'm delighted to introduce you all to Toya Walker, who is a public programs educator here at the Gorthold, and Emma Andrews, who is a teacher at Cullibacky College. Um, so both were integral in the delivery of Fashion Sense, and this project was a collaboration between the Courtauld and Austro Museum, and has been designed alongside the Renoir and the New Era exhibition at Austro Museum. So welcome both. It is absolutely amazing yeah. to have you here. Thank you for joining us. I thought it would be great if we could just ask you guys to introduce the ways in which you are both involved in Fashion Sense and the project. Okay, thanks Leila. Um, I'll start and then hand over to Emma. Um, my name's Toya, as you said. 
Um, I'm an illustrator and uh, part of the learning team at the Courtauld. And my role was to help design and deliver the Fashion Sense project. Um, it came about alongside the exhibition, using Loge as a starting point. Obviously, we wanted to make links with fashion and with the Courtauld's limited uh, textile history, which is also part of the air, you know, linked to the area. Um, it was also designed in the first and delivered in the second national lockdown. So that, uh, you know, really affected how we designed the project. Um, we decided to set a zine brief. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. So there's some uh, images to go alongside what I'm saying. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so we decided to set a zine brief for students uh, to create uh, the front cover and a double page spread of a zine. And the reason we went with um, a link with zines was many reasons really. One, because it links with my uh, work as an illustrator. Another, because it, it made sense for bringing lots of different ideas and themes together. It also seemed like a practical solution for lots of students who were working remotely and might have limitations in their access to materials. So it gave us some scope for, you know, Dean's culture is, is brilliant for DIY methods, you know, making the best of limited uh, resources, but also then moving into e-zines for people who maybe had access to digital, but less, uh, less materials that worked um, well. And um, yeah, and finally, I guess the idea of, you know, zine culture and often it being quite uh, provocative or challenging and how looking at that and then looking at Laloge, because often I think looking at impressionist works now or through our eyes, they can look quite pretty, maybe a bit chocolate boxy. And I guess, um, you know, really bringing home that actually this was quite a provocative image in its time that was that was intended to challenge. Um, so in order to work in these, you know, flexible way, we designed a workbook um, with which I got lots of opportunity to create some nice illustrations in um, so that students could work flexibly. And then I also delivered some of the sessions live on Zoom. And then for other schools, I also recorded some sessions um, for them to, to play at their own time. So it was all about working flexibly. Here's, uh, here's one of the pages from that source book uh, with ideas for activities and things. Um, and here's um, an example of some of the student work, the student responses. There is an exhibition, online exhibition on the Courtauld website. I'm sure we can put the link somewhere if anyone's interested, because there was some really great work from students across the different uh, schools that we worked with. Emma is a teacher at one of those schools and I'll pass over to her um, for her to explain her role in the project. Thank you Toya, thank you. So uh, thank you Leila as well. So my name is Emma Andrews and I am a teacher at Collybacky College um, which probably many people have not heard of. It's about geographically about 30 miles outside of Belfast. And we worked with a group of year 13 students. So these were students who in lockdown one uh, had their GCSE art and design uh, stop. They had to go and uh, complete it remotely. So we identified them as a, as a group that this project would be lovely for them seeing that they had missed out. They had done a year and a half of their GCSE course and then just missed out on the on the kind of last few months. So um, the it was initially, I think Tori, you had said there already, the it was initially meant to be uh, live workshops and then lockdown two happened, uh, which meant that um, yourself and your colleague Alice went back to the drawing board and created the resource and the videos then that we were able to share. So we taught this then 100% um, remotely and we did it via Google Classroom. And the, the videos, it actually worked out, although it was a plan B, um, it 
worked out to be in our benefit in that we could just deliver um, a video every so many days. So it didn't overwhelm the students. They could work at their own pace. If they didn't understand something, they were able to rewind it. Um, you know, they could ask questions. And so it actually worked out to be to our benefit. And then together with the resource booklet that, um, that we were able to provide them with, we were able to email it, that it was just, it was just a gift of a, a, a project. It was absolutely fantastic. It was so, in terms of uh, Toya and Alice's input, it was um, so thorough, so easy from a teacher perspective in terms of online to deliver. Um, it was just, everything was there. It was just, it was perfect. And, the, and a great, um, just a great opportunity at a time that was bad when pupils were at home, um, you know, they're not in class, they're not receiving face-to-face -face, um, uh, contact from their art teachers. Obviously things like galleries, museums, everything's closed. So to be involved in something like this, just um, kind of kept the ball going and kept the spark going. So it was the uh, right place, right time for us. Yeah, that's really amazing. And yeah, it definitely came at a really challenging time for everyone. And as a teacher, it must have been really hard to do it online, but that's really lovely to know that it was so inspiring for the participants. And was there any particular feedback that you thought would be interesting well, sharing today? Well, they, I asked them yesterday because we're now in December, we did this kind of February, March time. So I had them um, uh, yesterday, well actually this, this project actually doubled up because they were able then to use it as part of their A-level course. So um, it was just a win-win then all right. So it was so nice this year after having such a turbulent GCSE year, having a really turbulent first year of A-level, then to come into this year and um, basically they were able just to lift all of their work that they had submitted online and they were just ready to hit the ground running. So it was a really positive start to this school year. They didn't, there wasn't that kind of lull of um, sometimes, you know, just um, where it maybe takes a week or two to get things going. They were just ready. They knew what they were coming in to do. But um, some of the things that they just had me in yesterday um, that they enjoyed, they enjoyed the variety of it. They enjoyed that um, the videos were short. So they were maybe three, four, five minutes long. Um, they said they were really easy to follow, really easy to understand. Um, they enjoyed the variety of tasks. So each one was different. So they may have looked at um, collage or photography or um, typography. There was a garment making one. So they enjoyed just the, that each week or every three or four days, it was going to be something new. Um, other things that they had come, and Toya, you had already um, mentioned that, that, um, the that it was accessible. They didn't have to have really expensive art materials to do it. Um, it was inexpensive. They, they just needed scissors, glue. They could use leaflets that come through the door. They could use old envelopes, magazines, newspapers. Papers. The printouts that came in the resource booklet, they obviously could use them as well. And uh, a couple of other things then that they had mentioned that was the sense of pride of having their work then displayed for others to view and a sense of pride in um, being in an online exhibition that they, they were really delighted with that and uh, saw that just as a huge achievement. And also having the opportunity to see how the other schools, we were one of three in Northern Ireland um, that took part, but just to see how others responded to the same brief and, you know, they, they just enjoyed that aspect as well. Yeah, that's really great. Um, they should definitely be so proud of everything they produced and I'm Really curious to know what were the main issues that the students actually picked out of Laloge? Like what um, art historical representations, particularly around identity and dress, really piqued their curiosity and interest at that time? Because it's such an interesting moment in history, I guess. Um, we've never lived through anything like it. And I would love to know what they were particularly drawn to. 
So I had a look through again their work yesterday. I had a look through their zines and, and uh, they started the project off um, with looking at the painting and creating a, a mind map. So again, we're 10 months on and uh, although we, I delivered the project with them, um, along with two colleagues, I kind of, it's good just to go back and kind of refresh so some of the things, um, certainly um, areas that uh, kind of stood out for them where they were interested in making the comparison between um, the painting and then today's culture. So uh, a couple of kind of areas that I had just jotted down where uh, Nini's physical beauty that they thought she was very heavily made up. She had lots of, um, and Charlotte had said there about rouge and um, her lip color and uh, her eyeliner as well. And making reference then to today's culture of uh, filters on um, all of your apps, um, fillers, Botox, teeth whitening, things like that. So they um, kind of had drew a comparison there. Um, other things that they had talked about were about um, Nini's gaze, that she was confident that um, maybe at that time women would not have been as, as bold they were, where she's up front and she's, um, she has the full gaze of um, the viewer, that she's not, um, she's not going to shy away, that, she, that she's bold and that she's confident. Um, they also had, and uh, Charlotte had said there as well about questioning the relationship between the man and the woman. So they didn't, they were in very close proximity together. Um, like there wasn't much personal space, but you don't really, it's quite an uncomfortable relationship. So uh, a couple of them had looked at that. Uh, one of the students had um, noted about the gentleman having a beard and that that was um, not conventional from the time. So perhaps he was a rule breaker and made reference to the likes of, um, although it's past now, but David Beckham when he wore the sarong or Harry Styles with the long hair and, um, uh, and wearing the dress and kind of that idea of rule breaking. And then the kind of, um, I suppose with looking at the theatre glasses as well, that idea now um, about viewing people, about watching people and pe people's obsessiveness about others and um, also people's obsessiveness about themselves and how they're perceived, um, particularly um, in terms of this young group, um, how they're perceived online and their um, social media profiles and things like that. Um, so those were the kind of the main um, issues that they had that they had picked out. Amazing. I think we talked before about how what was most striking in this kind of personal response that they all had is that this project allowed you to build a scaffold around them, which gave them the confidence, but it wasn't you weren't telling them what to do. It was about tailoring and giving the tools um, to ignite or reignite this passion for the arts. So it's really amazing. And my last question was more about um, the process of actually producing these zines and Toy, I think this is more one for you. What was it actually like to have to work remotely um, on this project and produce these really wonderful illustrations? Um, so I guess, I mean, challenging in a way because what I love about working with young people is how responsive you can be and responding to their ideas and genuinely it's always refreshing and exciting what ideas people come up with. And that inspires you as someone working with them to come up with new ideas and, oh yeah, that's brilliant. What about, have you thought of, you know, and that is, it always feels like a gift still. Um, and when you are working remotely and particularly recording films, for me, you know, <laughs> produced quite a lot of anxiety for me because it's all, you know, having yourself recorded as we are now, it, you know, it, it can be quite nerve wracking, but also it's really challenging for me because I always, I, I don't like to feel that I'm being really didactic. I think, you know, it's supposed to be responsive and adaptive, but at the same rate, if you're not giving people clear instruction, it, that's not helpful either. So striking that balance with, 
hopefully allowing students to take their own interests, but still giving some clear guidance um, was challenging. And I think I really had to reframe the way I thought about it and thought what actually, you know, it's really, it was really difficult, everyone working remotely and, uh, and young people not being in school and experiencing that at home as well, thinking, what can I do? What can I give that I think might be helpful in that situation and that made me more positive about making those films and trying to make them these little these little useful things and hopefully uh, we succeeded a bit in that uh, but making the illustrations and stuff and because the resource really every page was supposed to be like another idea for how you could approach a zine I had a lot of fun with that so you know I think I embroidered the contents page so it was like right up my street from that point of view. Yeah, it was, it's absolutely amazing. So thank you both so much. It's really, really heartwarming to actually hear about how something can become a lifeline um, actually to create a dialogue and also to give you guys something to work on when we were in one of the many, many lockdowns. Um, but we will see you both in a wee while for audience questions. So please do keep putting them in the chat. But for now, I am delighted to introduce everyone to our final speaker. Aliyah Hussain, who is a visual artist and contemporary jewellery designer, and she's working predominantly with ceramics, adapting and using techniques and processes typically found in traditional ceramics. And um, she makes abstract, playful, sculptural works for the body with focus on line, form and colour. And informed by her visual arts practice, her jewellery is viewed as an expanded drawing practice, as all pieces are made using coils as a starting point which lends flow and movement to the piece. And she's been working on some absolutely beautiful pieces for our gallery shop, which um, I was eyeing up yesterday in the five minutes I got in between um, running around. But yes, thank you so much for joining us this evening. As I've just said, I'm such a fan of your work. It's so beautifully colourful and joyful. And I wondered if you want to start by telling us actually a little bit about your practice, what you do make and what materials you use. Thank you, Leila. Um, thank you so much for the invite and for that lovely introduction. And it's been really amazing hearing everyone else speak as well. Um, so yeah, as Leila said, I am an artist and jewellery designer. Um, I've been part of a creative artistic community uh, at Islington Mill in Salford since 2010. Um, my background is was in performance, movement and costume design. Um, but as my practice sort of shifted and changed in 2016, me and some friends set up a collective in a shared studio space in the old engine house of the old mill. Um, there are 10 of us there and we all have various art and design uh, practices. So I set up my jewellery practice inspired by my previous work in costume and movement, as well as inspired by the designers I was working with. Um, I did this as a way to support my artistic practice and find a way to bring in some of my experience into making more wearable objects. Um, my artist practice is quite varied and includes ceramic sculptures, collage, drawing and sound. Um, collage as a process underpins a lot of my ways of thinking and making, especially when working across so many different mediums. Um, I'm often inspired by narratives and fiction and create work that's quite abstract um, in order to find different ways of retelling stories. Um, so my jewellery making is very closely linked to my art and it runs along in tandem. So there's a definite overlap between the two. The jewellery often acts as like a sketch for some of my sculptural works, for example, and as for the materials I work with clay as my primary medium um, and the clays I work with range from like porcelain, stoneware down to through to polymer clay and for my jewellery I pair these clays with um, the, play, the clay components even with gold plated brass findings because I like the kind of warmth of the gold with the, with the way that the ceramic looks. Amazing, thank you. And now that I know that you used to work in performance and movement, I'm like, and now I can see that in your work. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so you've produced these absolutely stunning pieces um, that are inspired by our collection. And I wondered if you could now say a little bit about 
what artworks actually caught your attention and why they were the ones that inspired you and how you went about making them really relevant in 2021. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed this collaboration. Um, for me, it was really, really interesting to create works that were directly inspired by, so the, the project was looking at the works of the Bloomsbury group. So the artworks that were created, the artworks you have in their collection, um, specifically looking at a lot of the works that were produced out of the Omega workshops. Um, and so that was, they're a group of, I mean, I don't know, I'll just say a bit of my version of how I understand what they were up to. Um, a group of artists, writers, designers, thinkers, all kinds of people came together into the space to create, uh, I guess what they were doing is like creating a set of, of products way ahead of their time in a way, making using their art and design processes to collectively and slightly anonymously create all these wonderful things including like rugs and uh, painted pottery etc um so i think that um most artists kind of have to find a way to supplement and support their practice in this way uh, by making like products for sale or prints or jewelry in my case. So I feel like the ethos of the Bloomsbury group where they were creating this work as part of the Amiga workshops actually feels really similar to how I work, how the collective I'm part of, how they work. And it feels really, really relevant to the way a lot of us have to work especially how we've all had to adapt to things um in the last year uh, well last two years um so one of the main pieces that caught my attention um whilst designing this collection are a set of gouache paintings called uh design with confronted peacocks and basically there are a whole series of these designs some of them are quite stripped back ink drawings others are like more densely filled in paintings um and the design and the angles of the confrontation sort of shifts ever so slightly each time that this drawing is repeated and worked out um so I tried to be inspired by some of the movement of the patterns and the tension in the drawings, as well as the way the design shifts. So I'm also really inspired by some of the rug designs, which again have a lot of these very uh, kind of stripy, patterned, layered um, designs. And I think the patterns in this work, this collection of work, really lends themselves to the processes that I already work with. Yeah, that's great. Um, and yeah, the Bloomsbury group, I guess, now you're saying you work in a collective, I could see the similarities since they were kind of embodying an alternative bohemian artistic lifestyle, kind of banding together um, to try and change the world through art. So it's really lovely. Um, and on that note as well, I can see someone's actually asking this. Um, would you like to show us some of the pieces that you have created for the shop? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I'll share some images from the collection. Uh, bear with me as I do the sharing screen. Perfect. So just going to scroll through some of the images, um, which are, yes, the set of jewellery that I've created in collaboration with the Courtauld inspired by the works in the Bloomsbury collection. So I think for me, I really kind of relate to the sort of ethos and the activity of the Bloomsbury group in the Amiga workshops, especially how they kind of blurred the boundaries between sort of art and design and bringing in these kind of artistic, these thinking and turning them into these products. And I think my practice kind of really relates to a lot of that, as do the other people in my collective. Um, cool, so that's all the images. I don't know if I've done that too fast. <laughs> okay. No, they all look absolutely amazing. Um, okay, my brilliant. last question, I guess, to wrap up before we go to everyone else's questions is to, um, basically ask about the sustainability of the products and kind of ethical consumerism because I know 
this is something important to both of us and also important to the court all now that we have relaunched we've been really thinking about that we've been asking people like yourself to collaborate and produce really like, wonderful pieces and yeah I wonder how much that relates to what you do and what you've been doing with us yes um absolutely I'd love to talk about this so my work is like it's small batch it's slow made and it's all made to order by me in my studio so I'm not working necessarily towards seasons or following the kind of demands of, of retail holidays for example I sort of set my own pace and I don't really take on any more than I can manage I feel like there doesn't necessarily need to be kind of millions of these things put out into the world um I guess I will mention that the pieces in this collection are made from polymer clay, which is a type of PVC, so is a plastic. However, the material itself is really durable and the process ensures that these items will hopefully remain part of a treasured jewellery collection for a long, long time. And I believe, as many other artists who I know work with similar kind of materials, is that plastic should really be treated or learn to be treated as the precious commodity that it actually is and not as a throwaway item. So with all that in mind, I actively incorporate a no waste process into the design and making of these um, pieces. So when I'm creating specific patterns, like you saw the little components, um, I will end up with small offcuts of clay. And so within the design process, I've actively, uh, I've been, sorry, with these offcuts, I've consciously designed those back into the design process. Um, so for example, if you look back, well, maybe I'll have to share it again, but in some of the pieces, the more complicated designs end up with slightly more um, offcuts. And then I will create another component that incorporates those offcuts so they kind of smush down and, and then become part of a different component. Um, so also due to the kind of nature of the processes I use, which is maybe I'll explain the process that will help you understand how I kind of re bring back in this kind of no waste vibe. Um, so the patterns I make are created by sort of stacking and arranging um, uh, coils in different colors and then the kind of building up of those patterns into a long sort of cane um, creates the design and then those are then sliced up and then you have the kind of image in that way. Um, so I think as as I'm making these canes and as I'm slicing the patterns and the kind of shape of things sort of shift and distort as it's as it's kind of been pulled apart, they're pulled along. And I think that I try not to control that process too much. So sometimes the size or the pattern shifts and I sort of let it all happen quite organically so that it means each, there's not too much kind of control, so there's no way. So that each item of jewelry ends up with its own um, kind of unique personality and its own kind of uh, style compared to the other ones. Um, and then anything that kind of, again, because it's just me sort of working in my studio, anything that doesn't kind of make the cut in some ways will end up in an artwork at some point. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers some of your questions. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And it's really great to hear that each piece is unique. I think that's so important when you're buying things. Well, it is for me anyway. I love having <laughs> things that I know are definitely unique. So thank you so much. And I'm going to invite everyone else to come back because we have a few questions in the chat and we actually have about 15 minutes to get through them. But the first one is, where can we buy your jewellery? <laughs> That's a nice, quick, easy one for you. <laughs> uh, at the Courtauld in the shop. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can see some of my other work. Uh, I have an online shop, which I'll maybe I'll type that into the chat. Yeah. Um, I also have a few other stockists that I work with. You can see some of my work at um, the various Tate uh, galleries. I work with Nottingham Contemporary, Manchester Art Gallery, um, Kettles Yard. I kind of luckily have ended up in kind of art art gallery spaces, which feels yeah like a nice a nice place to show my work. 
Oh, amazing. Thank you. Yeah, definitely drop that in the chat so everyone can see it just in case you didn't catch it. But um, the next question we have is, do you think the painters expected that the viewer would understand the messages in their costume 100 years later? And how important is it that we do? So I wonder, I think that might be Charlotte's probably the best one to answer that. Um, I suppose that depends on the individual artist, really. Um, but I know for the Impressionists um, in particular, they were very interested in fashion um, because it had become, um, during their period, uh, a booming sort of industry. Um, and that sort of aligned with their mission, which was to depict modernity contemporary life um i suppose you have to wonder i mean if somebody saw a photograph of um you know someone one of us today in our favorite outfit um would someone you know 100 years in the future be able to pick up on maybe a band t-shirt what band that is um, or what kind of subculture they're associated with um that kind of thing, those kind of messages that clothes can send. Um, it's something that I think is very worth uh, researching um, when you're looking at a painting and in particular in the art of the Impressionists who, um, you know, amongst other uh, scenes of modern life, um, were particularly interested in depicting fashion. Great, thank you so much. And this is a question I think for everyone, which is about your own relationship to fashion and whether you have a favourite item of clothing, accessory or piece of jewellery that actually means something really particular to you um, or um, is there a piece of clothing, accessory and artwork that you would really like to wear or own? Now that's, um, I can probably think of quite a few that I would like to own the Courtauld bag is one of them. I always say this, but if you ever get to see it up close, you'll want one too. <laughs> what about everyone else? Um, I, uh, you know, I consider fashion to be art, so I would happily walk away with um, many of the artworks uh, that are in the Ulster Museum's fashion collection uh, if I could get away with it. Um, I think I don't I wouldn't mind Nini's dress I think it's pretty great um but personal favorite in my wardrobe is um there's this 1970s uh Marks and Spencer's dress actually that belonged to my aunt and then it belonged to my upper aunt and now it belongs to me and um I just enjoy wearing it every every time it comes around to Christmas it's a bit sparkly well <laughs> so but suitable for the era and it's mm -hmm. nice having something that you see you photograph from people in the past wearing and now you have it and you know you're kind of continuing a legacy that would be a favorite definitely amazing thank you and charlotte now i'm a bit worried that you and i both said we want to steal things from the galleries so <laughs> if anything goes missing they will know that. <laughs> this is being recorded <laughs> Emma, it's being you? recorded uh, uh -oh. <laughs> my big thing is I absolutely love Vinted and that has been my thing this year. I have eBayed for years, I have charity shop for years, but I really love the idea of slow fashion. I love that one person's trash is another person's treasure. That's, um, I have few, a few pieces that um, are sentimental, a few pieces that I keep, but equally um, I don't get really over precious about it. I will just quickly photograph it, sell it on. And I, I just love that whole culture of um, just moving things on. And uh, I probably would say 90% of what I own is, is secondhand or a uh, charity shop or vintage or whatever. Amazing. Does anyone else have any favourite items or any items from a painting that they want to have? Um, I make all of my clothes, uh, unless I buy it from a charity shop. But um, So everything today is homemade. So I, I think that does give you a different relationship with clothing and, and fashion. Um, 
Yeah, and I think the pieces that I really, actually, I'd probably say my daughter's coat because I really spent time. I, like, used lots of recycled fabric to quilt the lining. You know, like, I really indulged in a way that it actually is, a you know, if it was a product, it would never be worth the time it went in. But actually to invest that time in something and then see it worn every day is is uh, really lovely. That's amazing. I can't believe you make all your clothes and all your family's clothes. What? Yeah, again. <laughs> that's a long conversation. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. What a lovely thing as well, because it would, you know, your daughter's going to be walking around in a coat that really fits her and she'll feel really confident in, which is absolutely lovely. And Aaliyah, what about you? Do you have anything in particular that you love? Sorry, I don't know I have to unmute. <laughs> I love clothes. I, again, I wear, well, Everything I have is pretty much secondhand or a hand-me-down. Um, but the kind of reality of working in a pottery studio all day is that I'm mostly in clay-covered overalls, multiple layers of things that are not very glamorous at all. So I kind of have this, like, section of my wardrobe that I just love to look at, but rarely, especially in the last two years, have not had a chance to wear any of them. But I kind of have them as, like almost treasures now, things I like to try on. I just waltz around the house in them every so often and just kind of, yeah, really uh, enjoy them uh, in a way as objects rather than these kind of practical things because my, yeah, day-to-day -day is overalls and long johns and warm things in the studio. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I think we've got um, a lot of people here who love to buy things secondhand, which is great. Um, I also wanted to just read this comment out, which I think is really nice. Um, someone sent in that they love the happy accident, like the serendipity of the story that is around fashion sense um, and being able to pivot at such a challenging time and how actually it's a, you should be congratulated to that fact that it was so successful and it's really had an impact on the student's life. And I think it's just nice to read that out to you all just now. And I have one final question which is about, um, I think it's for you as well. Um, it's asking if, since you're based near Manchester, is there your use of clay and brass, um, is that related to Manchester and that area? I think they're thinking of old Hil Hilkington Pottery and Tile Factory. I think I've read that correctly. Hmm. Pilkington, that rings a bell, but I don't actually know where it is. Um, Manchester, I guess, is quite close to Stoke. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I guess it's kind of maybe in proximity to Stoke because my teacher, who is a friend of mine who taught me how to make work with ceramics, was from Stoke and studied in Stoke in a very traditional way. Um, at my background wasn't in what my the when I studied I didn't study ceramics that's something I came to through this friend of mine who's from Stoke which I guess is 45 minutes from Manchester so maybe the location kind of kind of works with that um but yeah I guess less so much about the place but more about once I was kind of introduced to the material having come from a kind of we were making costume working with fabric um Clay felt really, really different in a very transformative way. I kind of really enjoy the kind of alchemy of clay in, a, in the sense of sort of taking a lump of mud and turning it into something that potentially lasts forever and ever. Um, whereas I think I never really came across a material that has the potential for that kind of transformation. I think textile does to an extent but you're starting with a kind of flat plane and, and then building and working from that whereas the sculptural yeah transformative possibilities of clay was something that just really really grabbed me but yeah I'm not so sure if that's exactly to do with place but more an introduction to the material itself yeah maybe from someone happy, who's from yeah. Stoke <laughs> yeah maybe a happy coincidence yeah just, uh, um <laughs> Yes, um, so I think that might actually be all we have time for in terms of questions. I think if someone 
who's working on the tech behind the scenes might want to drop in the link to Fashion Sense so that everyone can see it in the chat. That would be really handy. Um, but we also wanted to wrap up by showing everyone at home this really exciting reinterpretation that we worked on with Rue Jazzle, who is a drag queen from Glasgow. And they have worked on this wonderful reinterpretation of Sleeping Girl by Kokoschka. And we showed it last night at our After Hours event. And I thought, do you know what? We should show it again to everyone that couldn't make it physically to the gallery. So here it is in all its glory. And I'm sure Rue will be very happy that more people get to see it. So thank you again to our wonderful speakers for joining us after what I know has been a really hard week for everyone. And thank you everyone from home for joining as well. As I said, this event has been recorded and we'll put it on the YouTube channel for the Quartold very soon. Um, so yes, thank you everyone. And thank you again to Bloomberg for sponsoring us. Um, so yes, please do stay in touch. The research forum is going on a short break for a few weeks, but we'll be back in January with our full programme once again. So check out everything we've got on then and stay safe, everyone, and see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>